through the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy, CANRAD. We're so honored that you've taken the time to join us for the 2022 Professor Dennis Brutus Memorial Lecture titled, When a Liberation Movement Becomes a Barrier to Liberation, What Next? My name is Nobubele Puza. I am a lecturer at the Mandela University in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and a keen sportswoman. Uh, recently for my sins, I now serve as the secretary on the University Sports South Africa um, Netball Executive Committee. Um, I will be holding the conversation together today and helping you navigate through the program. It's so wonderful to see people face to face. This is um, the first uh, institutional public uh, lecture that we're having in this fashion, and I'm hoping um, we're going to be having a really energetic uh, time today. I'm encouraging everyone who is joining us on YouTube on the live stream to make sure that they are very active there on uh, the YouTube page and sending us some of their questions and their comments throughout the whole program. I do have some announcements, but I just want to pause and allow the learners from uh, Patterson High to please come to the front. They'll be giving us a poetry item um, in just a bit. So some announcements. Um, we are streaming live, so if we are moving in front of the cameras, if we can do so quite quickly. Load shedding. We do have load shedding scheduled for today, apparently. So if anything happens, please can you stay calm, stay in your seat, and we'll get the generator up and running in a bit. This might affect the um, online streaming, but we do have Poncho and his team at the back who will organize us and get us up and running very soon. Um, we will be serving refreshments right at the end. They are halal, and we'll make an announcement for that again at the end. So before I hand over to the learners from Patterson High and their beautiful teacher as well, I just want to give you an overview of what our program is going to be today. We're going to start then with this particular welcome um, and just getting everyone orientated to what uh, we're going to be going through today. We're going to have the poetry item from the learners from Patterson High. And then we're going to have the official welcome uh, by Professor Andre Kiert from Nelson Mandela University. This will be followed by the keynote address by John Minto. And then we're going to have a round of uh, open question and answer from the floor and some from the uh, YouTube uh, page as well. Afterwards, we'll move to the second part of our event, which is the book launch, where we'll be launching then the book, Line Breakers, The Rugby Playing Sons of Magana and Stearman. Um, and we'll be having that conversation a little bit later. So for now, over to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jada Skulks, and I'm a grade nine learner at Patterson High. Brutus wrote in Siren's Knuckles Boots, take out the poetry and fire, watch it ember out of sight. Sanity resembles its ash, the moon relinquishes in the night. But here and here remains the skulls, a sudden turn will breach my ache, and I walk on soft cindered paths. Good evening all. I am Miss Marker and I am a teacher at Patterson High School. For thought or hope, what else can break? Brutus found a way of describing the South African reality through innuendo, as though speaking to or of a lover, about the struggle of love. Yet it was about the struggle of life in South Africa about the love of one's land. One of the poems that captured this merging of love and land that became one of my favorites was Night Song City. Sleep well, my love, sleep well. The harbor light glaze over restless docks. Police cars cockroach through the tunnel streets. From the shanties creaking iron sheets. Violence like a bug-infested rag is tossed, and fear is imminent as sound in the wind-swung bell. For the long day's anger pants from sand and rocks, but for this breathing night at least, my land, my love, sleep well. The sounds begin again, the siren in the night, the thunder at the door, 
the shriek of nerves in pain, then the keening crescendo of faces split by pain, the wordless, endless wail, only the unfree know. Importunate as rain, the wraiths exhale their woe over the sirens, knuckles, boots. My sound begin again. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mikhailo Mengur, and I'm a learner at Patterson High School. I'm in grade 10. It was in his second book of poetry, smuggled out of prison in the form of letters, and so, aptly entitled Letters to Martha, that Brutus describes some of the, some of the realities of, of life on Robben Island where he was incarcerated together with Nelson Mandela and others in the 1960s. In words that helped me, and I'm sure many others, understand what contributed to the resilience of those in prison for long periods. He writes in his first letter, in letters to Martha, after the sentence, mingled feelings. Seek relief the load of approaching days, apprehensions, the hints of brutality have a depth of personal meaning, exaltation, the sense of challenge, of confrontation, vague heroism mixed with self-pity and tempered by the knowledge of those who endure much more and endure. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My name is Joshua Rensburg. I'm a senior grade 11 learner at Patterson High. And I'm reading a poem that does not have a title. In a poem published in 1970. I am drifting on an Algerian beach along a med Mediterranean shore, and I am drifting. Others may lull in the kernel pool, washed by tide, sensual content, in a variable flow by regulated plan, but I am drifted. And the riptides rip and tear, erode and devour. An unrest questing his in my querying brain. And I beat on the fierce savage knowledge, rampaging through my existence, accepting the knowledge seeking design, for I am drifted. In a life and place and time, thrown by some chance, perchance, to an occasional use. A rare half pleasure on a seldom chance, and I grate on the sand of being, of existence, circumstances, digging and dragging for meaning, dragging to dirt and debris, the refuse of existence, dragging through the duno treadmill of my life, and still I am drifted. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Patterson High for that lovely uh, poetry that they've read. Before they leave the stage, I'm going to put uh, the Chair of Council, uh, the Nelson Mandela University Chair of Council, um, Ambassador Badil. If you could come and help me, please, to hand over a few gifts that we have um, from Nelson Mandela University and the Herald. Um, a gift to the library at Patterson High. It's the biography of Dennis Brutus um, that was uh, written by uh, Dr. Tyrone August, who was actually the keynote speaker in last year's, um, in last year's uh, memorial lecture. And then also, obviously, Line Breakers by Ashwin Desai and Ashwell um, Ajay.
was a wonderful way to start uh, the evening. I'm sure we enjoyed that piece of poetry um, and a powerful way as well to really anchor um, the legacy and to anchor the ideas of Janice Brutus, whom we are celebrating here today as well. To do the official welcome, I'd like to call up Professor Andre Kiet. I do have a bio note that I will read out. <laughs> Professor Andre Kiet currently holds uh, the research chair for the Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation and is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for the Engagement and Transformation at Nelson Mandela University. He's a former visiting professor at the Center for Race, Education and Decoloniality at Carnage School of Education, Leeds Beckett University in the UK, and in 2018 was uh, the Marsha Lillian Gladstein uh, Visiting Professor of Human Rights at the University of Connecticut. Professor Kiet served as a director and deputy chief executive officer at the South African Human Rights Commission and on the Commission of Gender Equality before joining the university sector. Since he's joined the university sector, he, is, um, he has held professional positions at the University of Pretoria, Fort Hare, and Free State. He has been serving as transformation advisor and practitioner in various capacity in the sector. Apart from his interest in human rights and social justice education, Professor, Kiet current, uh, Professor Kiet's current research and postgraduate supervision, which I am one of his students as well, focuses on radical approaches to the study of higher education, such as critical and abolitionist university studies. Professor Andre Kiet. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Novo. Um, it's great, I must say, and especially seeing a gathering like this uh, in honor of such a great figure uh, in our lives and in our history. So I would like to just start formally to say welcome to the 2022 Dennis British Institutional Public Lecture in the form of a community dialogue and then, of course, the book launch. Now, this responsibility of welcoming you to this particular lecture makes me feel sort of misplaced, you know, un unworthy to say something about this or that on Dennis Brutus because his life and legacy is too large for anyone to feel at ease in summoning his spirit or his ghost as a social figure of justice, so pushing Brutus further than himself out of respect and in admiration of Dennis. As Denise Zinn states in the 2010 memorial in her closing remarks, I encourage you all to dip into Brutus's work as you have heard so well presented by the students and the teacher, to be inspired by this national treasure whose life and contribution to our country and the world we celebrate here today, a life dedicated to the struggles for humanity, non-racialism, and global justice. This event is part of the great partnership we have with the Herald newspaper as a community dialogue since 2011, and I would like to acknowledge the editor, Rochelle de Kock. Many thanks to you and your team, Rochelle. We appreciate this productive relationship. A warm welcome to all present, online as well, including our Council Chair, Ambassador January Bardil, candidate board member, Dr. Basil Brown, members of the SEM board, and those who, with those who have, we also have a great relationship, the members of the Eastern Province Sports Legion in rugby and other codes, Peterson High School staff and students that you can see present here. A hearty welcome to our speakers, John Minto from New Zealand, Prof. Eshwin Desai from the University of Johannesburg and Ashwell Adrian from Makanda. Master Cannon, President of the Eastern Province Rugby and so forth and all of you attending tonight, a warm welcome. As far as our institutional public lectures are concerned, Brutus is in the illustrious company of Steve Bantubiko. We will have the 12th lecture this year, Raymond Mslaba, Victoria and Griffith Mkange, Dr. Govan Mbeke, Dr. Phyllis Ntantala and Prudence Mabele, Robert Mangaliso Zubukwe, and Dr. Brigalia Bum. So that is the array of lectures in which we honor some of the greats in our history and of our country. 
Dennis Brutus received his honorary doctorate at Mandela University in 2009 and died in December of the same year. Our university hosted a very poignant memorial early in 2010 and then decided to honor him through this lecture. For tonight, we have a great, fantastic lineup. So thank you very much, Alan and colleagues, for putting this together. So please feel warmly welcome and enjoy the fruitful deliberations. Many, many thanks for attending and honoring us with your presence. Enjoy. Thanks so much for that warm welcome, Professor Andre Kiet, and those um, opening remarks. We move now to the keynote address, which will be given by John Minto through a video that our technical team will put up in a short bit. While they're getting ready with that, I'd just like to read a short bio. Um, John Minto is a political activist, uh, best known for his leadership role in the protests against the 1981 Springbok rugby tour to New Zealand when he had the role, when he had the role of national organizer of Heart, Halt All Racist Tours. John was born in Junden and grew up there um, and in Napier, where he attended Napier Boys High School, where he received then a BSc um, in physics. He has also taught for many years at secondary schools in Auckland and Christchurch, mostly in schools in low-income areas. He's taken regular extended breaks from teaching, including five years working full-time for the apartheid movement and six years as an organizer with Unite Union. John has held many roles in organizations working for social justice and human rights. He has been, in, he has been active in supporting Maori struggles for Tino uh, Rangatira Tanga and was arrested during protests at the Bastion Point and Waitigani. He is uh, the convener of the State Housing Action Network, which organizes opposition to the privatization of state houses. He's currently the national chair of the Palestine uh, Solidarity Network, Aotearoa Ora. Aotearoa Ora. My apologies for mispronouncing that. Uh, John's family uh, links to Scotland, Ireland, um, and Croatia. He has two adult boys and lives with his wife uh, in Christchurch. Poncho, over to you with the video, please. Enga mana, enga reo, enga hoe fa, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. I feel honored to be giving this address in Dennis's name, and I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity and the privilege to do so. Dennis was always one of my heroes. I didn't meet Dennis until 2009 when I made my only trip to South Africa. It was such a pleasure to meet this elder statesman of anti-apartheid activism with his dramatic shock of white hair and his undimmed passion for justice. Um, I was envious of his hair, I have to say, uh, for obvious reasons. I'm going to talk about what I think we need to do when a liberation movement becomes a barrier to liberation. But to set the context, I'm going to talk a little bit about 1976 because it's a year where South Africa, New Zealand, colonialism, apartheid and Dennis Brutus all intersected. In fact, I first became aware of Dennis's name in 1976 at the time of the Montreal Olympics when he was working hard with others in the anti-apartheid struggle. Unfortunately, at that time, this little colonial country of New Zealand was standing with our kith and kin in white South Africa. And a government minister here farewelled the All Blacks touring apartheid South Africa by saying the team went with the, quote, goodwill and blessing of the New Zealand government. In fact, to the fury of most of the world, our All Blacks were playing the Springboks during the Soweto uprising, which had its 46th anniversary last week. Black school children were being murdered in the streets of South Africa in their hundreds. 600 black children were killed between the 16th of June and the end of 1976. And they, that killing was going on while the All Blacks were entertaining the supporters of the white regime in stadiums around South Africa. Earlier that same year, our Prime Minister Rob Muldoon had castigated Abraham Ordea 
the president of the Supreme Council for Sport in Africa, and refused to meet him when Ordea came to New Zealand. Muldoon infamously said, Ordea can stew in his own juice. And after that insult, Ordea left New Zealand early, and the follow-up played out in Montreal later in the year, where African countries tried to have New Zealand excluded from the Games because of that 1976 tour and a refusal of the government to admit there was anything wrong. When the motion to have New Zealand thrown out of the Games was lost, 29 African and Caribbean countries boycotted the Games because New Zealand was there. There was an immediate sequel to this decision, which is really important to remember. The glamour event of those games was to be the 1500 metres with Philbert Bay from Tanzania facing off against John Walker from New Zealand. But Tanzania joined the boycott and a front page photo in newspapers here showed Philbert Bay packing his bags in his room at the Olympic Village ready to head home. Bae said he supported the decision of his country to boycott because the freedom of black South Africans was more important than his personal desire to win an Olympic medal. Needless to say, John Walker won the 1500 metre run. But the most important observation here, however, is that Philbert Bae's sporting integrity is not so common today in elite professional sport, which is dominated by contracts, money and greed rather than the selfless human solidarity expressed by the Tanzanian runner. Over the past several decades, I've been a strong critic of the African National Congress and its failure to transform the South African economy to one that works for people rather than one that works for big business monopolies. In the 28 years since the ANC was elected to power in South Africa, the rich have got richer and the poor have continued to struggle. Two weeks ago, I was reading here about ANC leader and South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and the allegations of corruption around his reputed $450 million in personal wealth. And I immediately thought of a dinner I attended as a guest of an African state in the early 1980s. It was part, in part an acknowledgement of the work of the anti-apartheid movement here in the protests against the 1981 Springbok tour to New Zealand. It was a tour which had a huge impact at home here, but uh, although we didn't know it at the time, it also had an important impact in South Africa. So as a little aside here for the, for the students who are watching this, who, who've probably never heard of the Springbok tour to New Zealand in 1981, um, I'll just give this brief anecdote. Um, in 1981, when the tour was happening, Nelson Mandela was in prison on Robben Island. And he told us later, when he came to New Zealand, that when the prisoners heard that we'd stopped the Hamilton game during that 81 tour, he said the prisoners grabbed the bars on their doors, on the doors of their cells, and they rattled them right round the prison. They made a hell of a racket. He said it was like the sun came out. So getting back to my lunch, that I was invited to by an African state. It was a lunch at the flashiest restaurant I've ever been at. It was on a boat moored in the Thames River in London. And I was gobsmacked with these diplomats ordering hugely expensive French wines and discussing how their children were getting on at flash private English boarding schools. Needless to say, back in their home countries, education for the majority was rudimentary at best and life opportunities limited. The justification for this was that they said that, well, white politicians did this, so why shouldn't black politicians do the same? They even suggested it was racism to criticise them for their egregious behaviour. I sense and I see the same attitudes in the ANC leadership today. However, nothing sums up the ANC better uh, today for me than a single word, and that is Marikana. 34 striking mine workers were massacred by the South African police at Marikana. Cyril Ramaphosa was on the Lonman Mining Company Board of Directors, and instead of arguing for mediation, negotiation, 
de-escalation, he urged determined police action against the mine workers. He sided with wealthy shareholders against the workers and the world saw the result. Marikana was the ANC's sharp bull massacre and Ramaphosa was a key perpetrator. Over 40 years, he has morphed from mine workers champion under apartheid in the 1980s to liberation leader, to collaborator, to sellout, to apologist, and then at Marikana, to brutal oppressor, oppressor. So the ANC's transition from liberation movement to guardian of the rich is now complete. And with Ramaphosa's $45 million personal fortune, and let's be clear about this, no one ever gets half a billion dollars by their own efforts. It can only be done either through legalized theft or just plain theft. There's no other way. So how did this transition from liberation movement to corrupt government take place? Well, I think there are two things that are really important. Firstly, the turning of the ANC leadership away from its core principles and values. Now, the Americans have an expression for how this is done. They call it, quote, elite pacting. It refers to a strategy of targeting the top officials in a group you want to turn and lavishing them with luxury while working to convince them that free market economics is the only way forward. And so the leading figures in the ANC were targeted in this way with free trips to attend economic seminars in the US to be followed by all expenses paid holidays and flash resorts in Florida or the Caribbean where they were wined and dined. They became pacted with top US officials and quickly ended up slavishly following US dictates about the free market economic direction that ANC must follow. And secondly, most activists tell me they were looking the other way when South Africa's fate was decided in the early 1990s, before the first democratic vote was even cast. Activists were campaigning to prevent various attempts by the white minority to screw the scrum in favour of whites by undermining the negotiations around the constitution. They wanted a gerrymandered constitution which would elevate the, the power of white South Africans in a black majority country. Meanwhile, while that, those arguments about the constitution was going on, a small group of ANC leaders around Thabo and Becky were meeting regularly with the World Bank, the IMF, and giving them assurances free market capitalism would be the backbone of the South African economy under the ANC. The problem for the people of South Africa was that they put their trust and faith in the ANC leadership, trust which was rapidly betrayed. Black South Africans have gained civil and political rights, but oppression based on race has morphed into oppression based on class, and not much else has changed. Can the ANC be reformed to become a liberation movement once more? No. Even if the majority of members wanted this to happen, it couldn't. It's simply not possible to reform such an organisation from within. I can't think of any precedents which would encourage such a belief. I've met many members of the ANC who heavily criticise the organisation but end up saying, the ANC, warts and all, it's my tribe and always will be. Blind loyalty like that will always be a barrier to liberation. So what about the economic freedom fighters? Do they offer a way forward? No, I think they're also tied in with loyalty to personality and their political program from what I've seen is patchy, it's inconsistent and overall it's not coherent. So an alternative movement needs to emerge where loyalty is entrusted to a political program which transcends the vagaries of personality led leadership. Now, I'm not usually one for quoting other people, but here is a very helpful quote from Che Guevara. He said, liberators do not exist. It is the peoples who liberate themselves. I interpret this message to mean that it is our loyalty to each other and loyalty to a political program, which is the way forward, not loyalty to leaders. When the movement becomes more important than its political program, 
or when loyalty to leadership takes over from the drive to enact policies beneficial to the whole community, the seeds of political failure have been sown and fertilised. Many of us, myself included, are veterans of political movements of one kind or other, and we know how difficult it can be to develop a movement based around a political programme. I was involved in a movement here two years ago, which is um, uh, called Alternative Aotearoa, uh, and uh, we, were, we were doing that very thing, trying to bring together um, a lot of organisations to cooperate and to develop a, a joint programme of action. It's still, a, it's still a work in progress like many of these things. So how does South Africa move forward? Well, it would be arrogant of me from, from here in New Zealand to tell South Africans what they should be doing. But South Africa has at least two examples from its political history and its current practice worth looking at in this context. Firstly, the Freedom Charter movement of the 1950s was a successful attempt to develop loyalty to a set of political principles on which the liberation struggle could be built. The ANC was an outlawed organisation at the time and the Freedom Charter movement was an attempt to build political opposition to apartheid with a set of political principles at the focus. However, the Charter and its radical principles were gradually sidelined as the ANC developed strength around the personality of Nelson Mandela. Now Mandela himself was a great liberation leader, but when elected president, was unable to develop and press forward a political program to significantly improve the lives of most people in South Africa. The other example I want to give from uh, current practice in South Africa is the basic organising work being done by Abalale, Baza and Jean Delo, the Shack Dwellers movement. They are taking people from where they are, not from where they want them to be or from where they think they should be, but they're working with people where they are in, their in the daily reality of their lives and facing the basic necessities of life which they struggle to, to, um, you know, to be able to, to, to deliver for themselves and their families. I think the wrong way, and this is the way many uh, of the groups that I've been involved in the past have tackled this, the wrong way is to start with a blueprint and tell people this blueprint is the way forward. I think the blueprint has to be developed by people on the ground themselves. It has to be based around the actual situation people find themselves in, and the words must come from them with all their pathos and passion. And none of this is easy. If it was, we would all be living in a socialist utopia by now. But I want to emphasize there are no middle-class saviors for the poor and the oppressed in a free market capitalist society. But all of us have talents and gifts to help amplify a political struggle and build a movement which transcends any one organisation and pushes ahead through linking up together, sharing experiences, arguing, debating and discussing. I mean, we've all done a lot of arguing, debating and discussing over the years and that's, and that's important and we need to continue it. And in this way, we build that wider movement and bring strength, integrity and people power to the fore. In the meantime, the ANC will slowly wither away. But like a whale carcass, the decay will take a long time and it won't be pretty. And as it loses support and begins to collapse in on itself, the leadership will resort to the tried and true tactics of race baiting, just as Mugabe did in Zimbabwe. Through it all, the movement needs to grow stronger Personality is taking second place to goals, principles and strategies. A liberation movement learns from its component organisations and brings forward ideas and develops programmes to deal with the big global issues like climate change, human rights abuses and the endless wars to promote free market capitalism, as well as dealing with the day-to-day -day struggles of ordinary people. I hope these observations and suggestions will provide some food for thought um, I hope, I know that they exercised Dennis's mind when I met him in 2009. The struggle was his life. I want to finish with a short poem. The very first poem by Dennis in a book called Poets to the People, edited by Barry Feinberg in 1974. It's a poem which had a big influence on me for the power of its words 
to convey political messages through righteous anger. Ironically, the book this poem comes from is dedicated, quote, to South Africa's political prisoners and to the African National Congress and its allies. Dennis, if he were here today, would have a lot to say about that. Uh, the poem is called For a Dead African. And it was written for um, John Nangosa Jebi, who was shot and killed by the police in the Good Friday procession in Port Elizabeth in 1956. This is what Dennis wrote. <clears throat> we have no heroes and no wars, only victims of a sickly state, succumbing to the variegated sores that flower under lashing rains of hate. We have no battles and no fights for history to record with trite remark, only captives killed on eyeless nights and accidental dyings in the dark. Yet when the role of those who died to free our land is called, without surprise, these nameless unarmed ones will stand beside the warriors who secured the final prize. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for having me. I'll look forward to any questions later on. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, uh, John, for that keynote address. We're just going to get John up uh, on Zoom. Good morning, John. It's Nobu speaking. How are you doing today? Look, I'm, I'm doing very well, thanks. Thanks, Nobby. That's, that's marvellous. Yeah, and it's an absolute pre um, you know, a pleasure and privilege to be speaking with you this evening. Yeah, thank you so much. I know that it's very early there um, for you. So thank you so much for making the time to yeah. have this Q&A live with us. We've listened to the video and uh, the keynote address that you had prepared for us. And we're just going to open up to the floor and to whoever who is listening as well on YouTube to just... Uh, give their comments, their input, their thoughts as well to some of the provocative thoughts that you've given us today. So we've got two roaming mics for anyone who is with us in the South End Museum. Um, and they will uh, then raise their hand and then hopefully we'll have a few questions for you to, to answer. We'll start off with our first one and then hopefully that will trigger some thought as well for everyone else who, who has something to say. Um, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you, Nobu and John, for giving me the opportunity to ask questions on our keynote address. Um, okay, so let me first, first start by introducing myself. My name is Umnoto Randile Krele, popularly known as Uma Krele. Um, and last year I was um, honored by the Mayland Guardian to be part of the top 200 young South Africans under the civil society category. For 11 years, I've been in the social justice system. I've been trying to fight the injustices that the young South Africans have suffered since pri even before the Feast Must Fall happened in 2014. I think Nobu was also there down here, though, when I was still in, in UJ. And um, one thing that I have actually noticed, uh, particularly now that I'm in part of a civil society uh, organization, but on provincial level, is that even the younger generation that is coming in now, our minds are always for sale. So we are literally new blood for sale. If you, so if you come in and you get uh, coerced into being part of the blind faith that our forefathers are now, you know, passing away from, um, if you so much as o oppose what they're saying, you're sidelined and you are given uh, and, 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 and you are literally overlooked by the virtue of you having the value of integrity. Mm -hmm. Now as a leader and as a black female leader, I'm already marginalized. Now imagine having to fa suffer not just the oppression of race, but the, the oppression of gender as well. So you tend to be so overwhelmed when you're young and you're, and you're a leader that you just end up literally giving up and taking a seat because you just refuse to be for sale. Mm. 
So now why am I, who want to actually see my community of Shorterville, because Shorterville, I'm the overseer of Nelson Mandela District, okay? Shorterville is, is, is in the northern areas, right? Galvindale is in the top 30 of the murder capitals in the country. Stats of, of police, actually. And, and I'm here, but there's currently a national youth in Daba happening in Durban, and I'm not even here, and I'm the deputy chairperson. That has to tell you something. So for anyone of you, whether you are part of a community structure or not, high school learners, never ever take your integrity and put it up for sale. Put your people first. That is how you actually make history. Mm -hmm. so, So going back to John, I'm grateful that he actually said the things that we have wanted to say. Now our job here in this memorial lecture is to ensure that the words that we heard from John are being screamed at the top of the hills across South Africa. Even if it's across social media platforms, if it is in a class, if it is in a lecture hall setting, be that person. Blow that whistle because we are getting sick and tired of the detriment of our communities while the, while the selected elite are eating from what we are supposed to be having. So sure. that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much. Siabonga Matele for you. For your input and your comment. I was hoping maybe there would be a question somewhere in there that's directed to, to, to John, but thank you so much. I think um, what you're saying resonated quite a lot with people that are sitting here. And maybe there's another uh, person who has another provocation or maybe who would like to give input and add on to um, what Matel is saying before we, we, we hand over to John um, to try and uh, engage these particular thoughts that are coming through. Anyone else with a question, maybe online? Yes, we've got someone at the back, please. Yeah. Okay, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Uh, firstly, I just want to say I am from this area that you see on the, on the board there, South End. So I know what we have gone through and what John has mentioned there about how corrupt, for example, the ANC has become. Basically, they are, in my opinion, I'm sure that of many of the people present here, they are basically, they are very, very good organization with very good uh, values, but the wrong leadership. And I think that they are living up to the acronym of ANC, which is another national catastrophe. And I think they're going down that road to be exactly that. Also, the question I would like to ask, that John mentioned about the economic freedom fighters. The question I would like to ask is, what does Malema and his cronies know about the ANC that they can say and do what they want to without them being or getting the necessary punishment? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. John, if you're still on the line with us, um, do you have any comments, any thoughts uh, from the two speakers that we've just had? Well, yes, I, I do. Um, and thank them uh, both for their, for their, their contribution. Uh, look, my comment would be for the, um, um, the young woman leader. Uh, I think the, um, when you have power structures that are, that are serving a, you know, the... Um, you know, power structures which are serving the wealthy, they want young people to, to, to lower their expectations. They want young people to believe there is no other way, that this is the way it is, and this is the way it's always been, and this is the way that they need to live their life. So I think the observation that they expect um, young leaders just to sit back and not be for sale is, is a very important um, insight into how these, these systems work. So I think um, you know there is a there is an incredible history within South Africa of young people 
taking incredible um, strides in leadership. In fact, that in 1976, you know, it was black school children which led that, that uprising um, on June the 16th. And um, absolutely inspirational when you, when you see the interviews of those people um, at the time and later on. So, you know, young people have, have always been at the heart of the struggle and they will be at the heart of the struggle in, in, in the future. So um, I take my hat off to, um, to people who, can, who say, yes, I'm not for sale. That's so important. And the other um, comment, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not in, uh, engaged enough, I guess, with the day-to-day -day things happening in South Africa to be able to comment very much about the economic freedom fighters and uh, Julius Malema. I'm, uh, so it just seems to me that, um, yeah, that when I was there in 2009 and um, talking to people that there are some policies there that I thought were wonderful, but they were matched up with other policies that were that made it clear to me there was no kind of coherent program that could improve the the lives for ordinary black South Africans, um, uh, working class people in South Africa. So, yeah, I, I can't uh, add more comment than, than, than that. I'm sorry. Sure. Thanks so much, John. We've got um, a comment and a question that's coming through from the YouTube uh, page as well from Underdog One, and I suspect this is Mark. If anyone, <laughs> I suspect this is Mark. <laughs> um, so Underdog One, I will leave it at Underdog One for now. Underdog One um, reminds us of words that Dennis Brutus said on the 23rd of August in 2000 um, in it's now quoted in a book poetry and, po and protest on page 282 it says and I quote treachery treachery I cry out thinking of you com of thinking of you sorry treachery treachery I cry out thinking of you comrades and how you have betrayed the things we suffered for end quote and uh, there's quite a lot um, that Underdog One is, is, is commenting on, but really the question, John, to you is about how um, we can exercise then the right to debate and discuss in a world that openly thrives on and encourages censorship and silencing of protesting voices. So how do we navigate that as people that want to engage then in revolutionary discussions if then there's so much censorship and uh, silencing of protesting voices? I think the most important thing, and, um, and the first speaker, the young, young woman, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know your name, but I think um, the courage to speak out and continue to speak out. And um, I think when people speak out strongly, they, they, their voices carry further and it will resonate with people because in their hearts, um, I think people in South Africa know that things can be much better than they are. And uh, I think, yeah, so courage to speak out and not allowing yourself to be, um, to be sidelined or silenced or put down. That's, that's, that's the most important thing I, I can say. Um, I mean, Dennis's experience through, through his life would be uh, as someone who, was, who always had that courage to speak out in the most difficult of circumstances, you know. Um, but he was a, as I said earlier on, he was one of my heroes because he had that that integrity that carried him all the way through. So, yeah, courage, have courage, speak out, um, you know, um, you know, call it out, uh, call out the um, things when they're wrong. And, um, uh, yeah, I think doing that, you always bring a lot of other people with you. Thanks so much, John. Anyone else from uh, the South End Museum who would like to give another comment, a question, uh, before we hand over to you, John, to give then some closing remarks? All right, I'll read one more from uh, the YouTube live stream. John, it says, again, from Underdog One, uh, Ukraine has received overwhelming support since the Russian invasion, yet no such support has been visible for Palestine. Surely not yes. only Putin is guilty of war crimes. And maybe um, in your closing remarks, John, you could also um, just sum up as well some thoughts that you have on that particular question. Mm. Well, thank you very much, um, Norby. Yes, I, um, yeah, 
I'm, I'm involved with the Palestine issue here, here in, in, in New Zealand, and we see, um, we see the hypocrisy around the world where the, um, at least around, around the Western world, where governments are, are keen to, to condemn the Russian invasion and occupation of Ukraine. But at the same time, they refuse to speak out about the Israeli occupation of the entire area of historic Palestine, which has gone on since 1948. And uh, yeah, the, the sheer hypocrisy is, is, is quite breathtaking. Um, I'm, yeah, and, and uh, we here in New Zealand in our network, we're continually saying, uh, well, we're, we're doing our best to build a kind of international solidarity. We'll do our, our part in New Zealand uh, in the building of international solidarity. So in a sense, we link arms around the world with the people of Palestine. And uh, I know South Africa has been much stronger than, than New Zealand. Um, when, when Palestinians um, said, we're suffering under an apartheid regime, um, most of the rest of the world um, just turned and looked the other way and said, you know, it's not going to happen because of the, the strength of the pro-Israel lobby around the world. But in South Africa, people like, um, well, Nelson Mandela and then people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu were saying no. In fact, um, Tutu said, it's, uh, it, what's happening in Palestine is worse than what happened in South Africa. We didn't suffer from the, the, the intense... Uh, control of the community which the Israeli state has around Palestinians. You know, it continually has its hands around Palestinians' throats, essentially. And, um, yeah, so so I'm part of that movement. And I know people in South Africa, as I say, have, have been much better than other parts of the world. But, yeah, hypocrisy is everywhere. And we, we should be calling that out. And I just mentioned two other places of... Uh, which people may not be so well aware of. One is West Papua, which is quite close to New Zealand. Um, if you go on the map, you know Australia on the world map, and just above Australia is this very large island. Well, the left-hand side of the island is called West Papua. The other side is Papua New Guinea. Well, West Papua has been occupied by Indonesian troops um, since the 1960s, 1963. And the, and the West Papuan people are struggling for their freedom. They are fighting and they are dying um, under this brutal um, Indonesian military occupation. And then people of Western Sahara in the, in the northern part of, of Africa are occupied by Moroccan troops. And they, are, they, are, they want their freedom. They're fighting for their freedom. So these struggles um, are there and we need to, you know, link arms around the world uh, in, in that regard. So, look, I've got this T-shirt on. I don't know if you can see this. Um, yeah, so this is that's the Palestinian flag, and at the top it says um, apartheid uh, wrong for South Africans, and on the bottom wrong for Palestinians. So um, yeah, that's that's the audio visual that I have to go at the end of my talk, and I hope uh, that message uh, resonates with people there uh, at, at the lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, John, for joining us. Thanks so much for joining us, John, and really thank you so much for um, your uh, keynote address. We are going to say good morning to you um, and, and send you Yes, off. it is. It's, uh, it's almost half past four in the morning here. Um, so, um, uh, Nobu, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to be speaking, and um, I'm, yeah, thank you so much for, um, for, the, for this opportunity. Thank you so much then, John. Cheers. Okay, so we move now to the book launch. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was done today. Okay, did you need a plan? Yeah.
Then go sit down. goes to death. Mm. Go sit down. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Dada, for reminding us um, really why we are in this uh, Professor Dennis Brutus Memorial Lecture. Uh, really reminding us of the ideas and the actual legacy that we're supposed to be pushing forward today. I am going to give other people um, a chance um, in the open discussion and Q&A once we get some of the thoughts from the authors and our respondent, Umastop Cannon, um, about the book. So I'm going to ask um, Ashwell to join me in the front and I'm going to ask Umastop as well to come in uh, to sit with me here in the front while we discuss uh, just a few things about the book. The book itself, the book itself, um, there are some copies that I did see at the back. So please um, feel free to ask Canrad and to ask anyone from the Herald as well about where you can purchase um, this book. I know that we do have some copies here. It's called The Line Breakers, The Rugby Playing Sons of Magana and Stearman. And we're going to have a conversation here with uh, the authors. Um, I know that uh, Ashwin Desai is going to be joining us via Zoom. So he's going to appear on our screen in a few seconds. And um, we also got um, the co-author as well, one of the authors, Ashwell Adrian, who's also going to um, give us just some of his thoughts as well about um, their journey to writing this book and how it really came about. Um, so maybe while we wait for uh, the technical team to sort out the, the Zoom feed for us, I might as well read for you then, for some people that haven't had the luxury of um, getting a, a copy of the book, I'm going to read then some extracts from the foreword that was written by... Oh, Lord, next time, Sagbiz. Oh, no. thank you so much, though. And maybe as we, we settle down again, I'm going to read then a little bit of an extract from the foreword written by Mark Alexandra about the book. And he says, far too little has been recorded and written about the origins and development of black rugby in South Africa and the Eastern Cape's proud legacy as the birthplace of legendary players and clubs from as far back as the late 1800s. Grahamstown is central to black rugby history and is the primary setting for this book, aptly named Line Breakers, the Rugby Playing Sons of Magana and Stearman. Grahamstown was renamed Makanda in 2018 in memory of the Kosa warrior and prophet Makanda Gangaele, also known as Magana, who led an assault on the town and was captured in 1819. Likewise, David Henry Stearman was a coy leader who led rebellions against the British in the eastern part of the Cape Colony between 1799 and 1803 and twice escaped Robben Island. Later in the foreword, he says, Line Breakers, the rugby playing sons of Magana and Stearman, is an important testimony to the powerful impact that the early pioneers of this great game have had on the development and history of the sport. It highlights the passion, skill, and dedication that have long characterized rugby in the Eastern Cape. Do we have Ashwin on the line as well? 
Maybe, Ashwell, let's start with you. Um, and you can take us through your thoughts when you were writing this particular book. Um, how does it come about then that you and Ashwin Desai then come together to write such a book? Look, um, thanks very much. Uh, I got funding, I applied for funding to the National Heritage Council uh, to do an exhibition on black rugby in Grahamstown. I did that uh, exhibition and was completed in 2009, but at the same time collecting a body of work, including interviews with uh, a number of ex-rugby players and administrators, and photographs. And those photographs was very intriguing. I used them in the exhibition and um, kept them, the exhibition was on hosted by the Dakawa Arts and Crafts Center in Grahamstown for a while, and for a while at the Albany Museum. But it was a painstaking exercise in collecting the interviews, the photographs, because, I mean, they belong to people, mm. and it was about them, about their fathers, about their mothers, the roles that some women played in, in, in rugby clubs, the history of those rugby clubs in Grahamstown. You had your Winteros that uh, was established in 1887. You had Lily Whites five years later. Um, you had Easterns and uh, clubs like Buffaloes that were there. Uh, but there was no archive that was uh, there that we could go to at your Cory Library or any other archive. It was an archive that we had to build ourselves. So for me, it was like that passion of developing something that could be preserved for many, many more years. And I also see this book as a catalyst for whoever wants to do something like that, mm. that this is here something, we can do more. That's how I see it. Mm. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to check again with the technical team. Do we have Ashwin on? Ashwin, hello. It's Noble speaking, the facilitator Talking here at the book lodge. Can you hear? Can you hear us, Ashwin? I can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks so much for joining us. I was just about to read um, your reflections on writing the book and how it came about um, that you have in Behind the Lines um, on page 122. But since we have you on the line, then please, can you give us um, your thoughts on this journey that um, you took with Ashwell to to write this book? Ah, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, thank you and and thank you for the university, the Herald. Uh, for hosting this, and, and, and I think both Ashwell and I are, are incredibly humbled uh, that this has happened, and especially uh, to celebrate the life of Dennis Brutus, uh, who I got to meet in Durban, and in many ways had a, had a significant and major influence on my life. Uh, whether for the better or the worse, we can judge that later. But really, uh, this, this mad journey began in 1979 when I arrived in what was then Port Elizabeth and was going to study at uh, Rhodes University. I waited at the airport. There was something called the Leopards Express. Um, and after four hours of waiting, I found out that they didn't accept uh, non-whites onto their bus. And uh, I had to hike uh, from outside PE uh, to get to the then Gramstown, now, now Makanda. And, and, um, and it, it began that journey. And really, in many ways, I arrived as an outsider, as a student uh, in Makanda, and it changed my life in many ways. And the fact that Ashwell and I and Master of Canon still know each other means that we've been friends for 40 years. But in many ways, I had a tumultuous relationship with Makanda. Uh, many of the people who I played sport with you know, uh, thought they were quick with a knife. Well, I was quicker because I'd come out of Durban and the ganglands. 
They thought they could kick me in the leg. I could kick them in the chest. Uh, I was brought up on the streets of Durban. And so began, uh, and, and I fought to them even politically, uh, because uh, in Makanda, the, the Stalinists were, were in control, and, and I was a free thinker. And that uh, incredible tumultuous relationship still remains, and I still quarrel and debate, and, and also pay homage to the fact that my own politics, my own uh, sense of what is non-racialism was, was born and bred on the, on the streets of Makanda. Um, and, and so this book was born out of that relationship. But I think in more immediately, uh, uh, Ashwell always pushed me uh, about uh, writing this book. And I thought, how do you write a book where people are not in the archives? How do you write a book where people are not in the newspapers or they don't have statistics? There's no reports. Um, and, 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 and with the coming of Sia Colisi and just the way he was received, as if he was an immaculate conception of white people, and, and he, was a, he was a result of going to a white school, um, really, I think, motivated and gave me and Ashwell the Philip we needed. Because when we went through the records, at the turn of the 20th century, in 1904, there was a Khaleesi in, in Makanda who started a, a rugby club. In 1930s, there was a Khaleesi in the Eastern Cape who, who, who played rugby. So Khaleesis have been playing rugby for 100 years. And so part of the attempt to decolonize knowledge. The way people want to decolonize knowledge, they just want to debunk. They want to read against the grain. But decolonizing knowledge means we create new knowledges. We challenge what is there. We rewrite history. And, and, and so this book was born out of that. It was born in a deep sense of the fight that people had for a militant non-racialism. And that is our book, it's called Makana and Stierman. People talk about Robben Island as if Robben Island started in the early 60s with Mandela and Katrada and Neville Alexander. Well, you know, long time before that, Stierman and Makana tried to escape from Robben Island. There was a unity of Tosa speaking people and the Khoisan. And so the book also builds on that history into the present. And, and for me, the challenge, especially for people at universities, they all want to decolonize knowledge, but they don't want to do original research. They don't want to create new knowledge. Our idea of decolonizing knowledge is that we become world class at our research because colonized knowledge produces stupid people. Often when you have more degrees, you're more stupid. Hendrik Fulfoot was a professor. Many of us were brought up under a colonial education. We are bursting that asunder not out of just and reading against the grain, but creating a new way of looking at the world. And so for us, this book is a contribution, a challenge, a provocation to that new way of looking at the world. Sure, thank you so much for that. <laughs> And I think, Ashwell, that really speaks to what you were also um, uh, alluding to about the methodologies that we're using to collect the data. And maybe you can um, say a bit more about, um, you know, this idea of collecting data in a new way and allowing then the people that had the photographs in, in, in Makanda and the people that were giving you the stories to also be your teachers in this process about this, um, this history that you're trying to uncover. And I, I think if we think about it, anyone who's uh, pursuing research, um, when you think about what the university tells you about what it means to be an academic versus what is being done in this data collection process um, by Ashwell and Ashwin um, in, in, in their recovery of this history, I think another contribution is just the methodology itself, how you went about uh, going about collecting this data. Could you say more about that? Yeah, look, I mean, I was trained in oral history when I worked at Robben Island interviewing a host of political, ex-political prisoners. And I mean, that set the tone for me because I could see what we have done at Robben Island with these interviews that we did with these people. The same can be done with people in sport and they can tell this, their own story. And we can, uh, we can, we can complement that with what we have in terms of photographs and what we understand. Because you must understand that people never played rugby because they, play, they wanted to play rugby. It was a form of resistance, not only to the apartheid state, but also to 
the conditions that prevailed, you would find that uh, St. Andrew's Kingswood College was there and I mean, I, I, I saw the other day the two teams, schools playing against each other. I couldn't believe it. How many people went to go and watch that rugby? But when we played Nyalusa as Mary Wirtis in Cremestone or on Sika, it wasn't so full. Now, these days, there's no rugby there, you know. For me, it is, it is, it's a continuous process. You have to go back to people, make sure, read the interview, uh, transcribe it, read it, and see what points you missed so that people can understand exactly what the point is that you're trying to bring across. I think surely if anyone's going to do uh, that amount of intense research, you must have some kind of background then in the sport yourself. Yeah, I used to play rugby. Uh, I was also captain of border schools under the, in the non-racial era. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm still enjoying it. I'm watching rugby now and then, but mostly local. I, I haven't been to the local fields to watch rugby. Um, and you're posing such an interesting um, question here for people that are players. And I think a lot of people in the room as well have, have been players or are still players or are coaching players or know players in their, in their communities. And you're talking about playing as a form of resistance. And maybe we can tackle that question then and that thought a little bit in the open Q&A. Um, Ashton, I'm going to come back to you then here. And, and um, maybe you can uh, have a, a, a discussion with us about I know you've mentioned Kolisi and you've mentioned Manana as well and how um, there's this lineage that you recover um, about how they have come to be the main Kolisi, but there are so many other Kolisis and, and Mananas that are, are, in, are in the book. Maybe you can give us one or two of your most favorite stories that you uh, came up with and Ashwell, I'll come to you afterwards just now. Well, you know, the, 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 the idea is often when you do research, Many of us, for all our freedom of thought and freedom of expression, want to do research um, in ways that just reinforce our predisposed ideological dispositions. But often, sometimes, research shocks you. It challenges you in the face. It changes your life. And this is what this book did. I spent so long in Makanda. I spent so many hours in meetings. I went to funerals. But I never knew, only when I interviewed people, when I listened to their voices, did I realize the depth, the sheer, the sheer commitment that people had to non-racialism. They, they at the, in the beast of the apocalypse, when, 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 when people like uh, the judge Lexing party, when, when he couldn't serve white people and had to be removed from a job because he was a barman before he became a judge. When, when, when you talk to people like that and you realize what they wanted to build, the, the anti-racist anti way in which they wanted to live their lives, it humbled me. It, 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 it moved me in ways that I, I, I lived there, I played with these people, but I didn't know the sheer humiliations of an everyday life of a black person. We are still university students. But you know, despite that, there was an ideal, and that ideal bore itself out in Grahamstown when there was a colored rugby union and an African rugby union. And people built this because, as somebody said earlier, people make history. And they made history by breaking these barriers. And when you listen to words, uh, the words of Dennis Stierman, a, a, who has a bloodline all the way to David Stierman about how he was brought up, how he saw identity, how he, what he thought about building and how he thought about playing in the clubs that he did play for. It wasn't just a rugby game. It was a building a militant, non-racial, anti-apartheid resistance. So why, why, why am I emphasizing that? Why am I not only talking about the game itself, which I want to talk about and, I just, and, I, and, I, and I'll say a bit about that, is that today, the ANC has not only destroyed our past, it's not only destroyed our present, it's destroying our future because it's taking away that history. 
and I don't have any truck with the way in which people are using race to advance themselves, the way they are using race to divide and, 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 and how quick they are going on that populist line, uh, a kind of, you know, they'll be against Narendra Modi, they'll be against uh, Trump, but somehow they will, they will somehow dig deep into some kind of narrow African chauvinism. I am militantly against that and my writings and my activism opposes that as a challenge. And so those stories of people who went to jail like Pila and Kai out of Robben Island come back and build a non-racial movement. Master of Cannon who is sitting there, the kinds of commitments that people made, not only on the field of play, but beyond the field of play, move me. I lived that history, but I didn't know it. And it is a tragedy, I'm not, I'm just finish on that. It's a tragedy that when I came to Gramstorm, I spent a long time coming and having my holidays, meeting comrades in the then Port Elizabeth. And where is the history? We were brought up on the history of the two Desmonds, Desmond Kramer, Desmond Boyson, on Charles Clayboy, the rich history of Kwaru and how they broke through into the non-racial fold. Where is that history? Why don't you just get off your chairs and begin to write that bloody history instead of always talking about Ramaphosa, state capture and so on. We have a history that we can be proud of. It will be lost. Uh, maybe something that uh, also stood out for you in the book, um, a highlight, I suppose, besides then the, the collecting of the data itself. Look, it, it is the story that, that got to me the most is George Lamani's story. I mean, I, I saw Temba Lutuaba here tonight, one of our heroes in the non-racial era. George's story is, is so... He explains himself so patiently. George was a small man, small build in stature, and George had come through eventually getting the honor of playing in a Saru team from Cramestown. Same as Dennis Stearman, Chisco Ndabeni from Cramestown. Those stories that we were able to document that is what I would like to see other people doing. Kwaru's history, Eastern Province's history, frontier, Veru, border. It, it needs to be, to be documented. Thanks. Bring you in uh, now, Master, uh, in terms of how you received the book. Um, I think you've heard quite a lot uh, from the two authors, Ashwell and Ashwin, about um, what their thoughts were and what they had envisaged when they wanted to bring the, the, the book forward. So how do you receive it then? Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for affording me the opportunity to participate. I think I'm going to start where Peterson and I have started um, because I had the privilege of meeting Dennis twice. I met him in the early 90s when he came into the country to come and address uh, us as students at Dower College. Uh, and he was profound. Obviously, he locked horns, almost the type of horns that we see, the type of cattle that uh, Ramaphosa is selling. <laughs> he he lock horns with Danny. Danny Jordan, I think people know him. Uh, who at that time, because it was the pre cursor to, to unification. Some uh, coming together on a basis of multiracialism. And he spoke strongly against that. Um, and obviously, he invited uh, Denny to a bilateral and, and we were excluded. 
so I didn't enjoy that intimacy. Uh, but to come back, in 2007 I met him, I had the opportunity, uh, Peterson and I, to meet him again. And after the day's event, um, he read, and I hope uh, Eshwin will listen, he read the following poem to us, not read it, but he recited from, from his head. Obviously, it was later captured by Professor Cornelius, uh, and it reads as follows. Um, Milk blue under the moonlight, midnight sky, receive me now, my sleeping love. Love, gentle and luminous glow, Arches from circling, rising in hills to the to the plain, your tarantula's breast exposed. So, so gentle and tender, I brood and bow over your scent, your head springs and mirth. Obviously, there was a break then, but then Eshwin encouraged him to get to the part, that part. Um, and he continues, we have done our things, but we could have done it better. Now, that's my experience of him, and early in the day, I, my experience of him was that he's forthright. Um, he stays unmoved, uh, and he stands for what he believes in. Remember, and I'm now coming closer to sport and probably closer to the, to the book because I am proudly Makandian. I've been born there. I've studied in PE. And whilst people tried me to convince me to stay behind and play sport here, I said no, uh, I'm going back home because my heart is where my home is. But Brutus have also ventured into sport. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the previous keynote speaker have said him, he become aware of him in 76. In fact, he started his crusade earlier on, and he started it right here in P PE, setting up uh, Senrock, that was Sasa then, uh, trying to isolate the, the cultural side of South Africa to bring about social change, fighting for social justice. He continued that on his return with Jubilee 2000 and, and almost fought single-handedly an international uh, crusade where he asked that the apartheid debt be scrapped and that debt was then retained at the behest and protection of the government of the day. And it's still with us. Now, to come to the book uh, by Eshwin and, 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 and Eshwo, uh, initially I've asked of the thoughts of a close friend, a very close friend, please give me a summary of the book. Um, I have the lived experience of what's in the book. I was born into rugby. Um, I grew up in a household that is reflective, or in, in some instances short of reflective, what's in the book. But that, that's, that's natural, and I think Eshwal have rightly uh, uh, stated earlier on that maybe this is the stepping stone for more. Now, I only have uh, uh, memory not much research and archives, and I've discovered this last week also, 
uh, when I interacted with South African Rugby in the Human Rights Commission. Uh, because I've been duped and all black. Um, and as the citizen earlier said, I'm an African. I believe I'm an African. I pronounce it uh, that I'm an African. Um, I associate myself with black people. Everybody here that is black, therefore I'm all black. Uh, <laughs> So my allegiance shouldn't be questioned. I can talk, I, if they refer to the All Black team, I have a problem with them. Uh, because uh, earlier on, you know, I wanted to ask John, shouldn't they ignite the same routine now at the New Zealand headquarters in Wellington for what they've done in 1981. Because New Zealand had the audacity to declare a hundred years anniversary with racism. Endorsing South African history based on race. Now, if, if I can come back to the book, um, my friend who have written a, 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 a review of the book have said to me, the title might be misleading in the sense that uh, it gives unnecessary leverage to the end that is still race, that still entrenches race, because it almost romanticizes Sia Colisi. Um, whereas the other side of, 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 of uh, the equation, obviously, is that, um, if I can read the title, Line Breakers, it can probably also be, be that it contrasts. Look, there was a history. It's not known. Now there's a history. And the history that confines us it's not necessarily the history reflected in the book, but it's a history of racism. The racism that was started by Paul Ruiz in 1908, that was further entrenched with uni, uni, uh, um, uh, uh, the first collision between the British and the Africana in 1910, when they reached an agreement, our cultural tool that will unify us is rugby. And, and, and it's still prevalent today. The only, only difference that now they have uh, um, conduits that looks like you and me, but practice uh, racism. And, and that, that is where probably uh, I fit in, into the script. I know the history that's outlined. I know all the people that's been mentioned. I know uh, Dennis Stierman. I know George Lamani. In fact, George Lamani and myself was the last, the very last, Secos stalwarts in Grahamstown. The very last. Uh, to an extent that George was ostracized. Um, that's, that's my memory of, of, of what happened. Also in the book, the book clearly illustrates that it's, it's born out of struggle. Uh, out of struggle of, of one people, not separate people. Not Isikosa, uh, Eshwan, not Koi. One indigenous set of people that fought a, 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 a valiant, valiant fight. Now, it is in the book because most of the people ref reflected in, in the book, um, can we, we can rightly refer to them uh, in, 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 in high, hindsight that they were sport liberating fighters. We can say that because to my memory, 
and, and one of the, 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 uh, the clubs in the book is called Rainbows. Now, I grew up with my, with my grandfather, who was a rainbow uh, official. Uh, so I know the history of, of the club. But I also know the significance of the club in history, um, in struggle. And one person that comes to mind and is not alive anymore is Eugene September with the nickname Hammer. When in the 70s, with the All Blacks coming into the country and students taking to the street, um, there was also within sport, because that was after the establishment of Cedru that's, that's in here. Um, in, in, in 72, that there were efforts to break the non-racial and anti-apartheid uh, movement, driven by sport. Remember, there were no political activity. The only political activity at the time was sport, and, and rugby was one of it. Obviously, there were, were other uh, sporting codes like athletics, swimming, etc., etc., etc. But we will you will you won't find it in books. It only resides in our memory. Now. Let me just reflect on my visit, my accidental visit with the human rights uh, uh, um, uh, uh, activity last week. I was up against a person called Mark Alexander. Now, this is where the contradiction of line breakers probably lie, because he prefaced the book, and he acknowledges the role of black rugby. But then he also, in the commission, rubbishes the archives because he was asked, where are the archives of unification? Come and reflect on it or produce it. Because my contention and a friend that I've accidentally met uh, uh, as a result of, of, of what I'm pursuing, he, uh, Kaya Mdaka, because both of us claim that the springbok is equal to the apartheid flag. Therefore, it's racist. And it should be removed. Now, I'm glad that I'm sitting on the side of Azure, because I am gathering data and I know as you'll have the memory, I have this book where it illustrates that the spring book was never accepted. And a signatory to the book, Eshwal, and Eshwan is Lex and Party, uh, the retired judge. Hence, I'm maintaining that, and, and I'm, 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 I'm with John, we need to be the change that we believe should have happened in 1994. I'm a sports person, I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician. I, I'm a sport activist. And yes, I took my, my learnings from, from Dennis Brutus, another one. I've used him when I made a, a presidential address at the last AGM of, of Eastern Province. Um, I've also brought in Neville Alexander, who I believe have a, a deep-rooted understanding of what anti-racialism, non-racialism is, and how to accomplish a, a nation building. Because the question that's not been addressed even within SA Rugby uh, is how do they contribute? How do they contribute to nation building and not the current phase that is there of elitism that becomes the new racism? Yeah. And that's the challenge that we are facing. Sure, I think that's a, a great place to...
Yes, thanks so much. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of questions that are being raised there um, and a lot of challenging thoughts um, that we have to mull over as well. Um, so I'm going to open up now to the floor and also when I say the floor, I'm also meaning everyone else who's joining us on YouTube. Please feel free to invade um, the chat section. This is the time for Twitter fingers. Please uh, feel free to share your comments, your thoughts, your congratulations as well on such a wonderful book um, that we've, we've received uh, here today. I'm going to take the first three hands that I see. One, two, three in that order. Um, and then we'll hear from other voices in a bit. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hear what Mr. Marsdorp is saying. And you might not understand what I'm talking. I still come from the old school. So I use the word colored, white, African, don't jump out of your seats. Yes, a gentleman mine is wearing a circus dress on top. There he goes. So whatever I'm saying, you can ask him, is the right thing I'm saying. Circus was basically a so-called colored movement. And Quaro Rugby was the only team that was part of that. But the point I'm going to get at is very important. You young ones, you weren't during around the party years. So sometimes you might wonder why so many colors, so many blacks love the all blacks. And the young generation, they love the spring box. So what happens? I might love the all blacks. They play good rugby, not stump, stump rugby anyway. Mr. Marsdorf can answer that. But my son might like the spring box. He's the young generation. I would have it against him. Because that's what they like. But suckers stopped the party government in such a manner that they had to submit to change whether they liked it or not. I honor those that went to Roman Island. They made a change. But suckers was a political body in a nutshell that stopped Graham Pollock, you don't know Graham Pollock, but search him up. <coughs> Barry Richards, Kirsten, not this Kirsten, the elder brother. And they were seen as great sportsmen. They were great through the white man's eyes. If you know Peter McCarter, he was better, he was the better, he was a half a fly off. There was no white guy on this planet that was equal to him. And that's the truth. You'll find at the end of the day, you'll ask the question, where's our archives? The problem was, we never knew that the whites made sure black sport and color sport, there'll be no history. So ask any color guy, where's this person you speak about? Cousin Juba, my reference point, Mr. Marsdorf, he was the best scrum of ever had. But I can't expect the young generation to say, well, who's Cousin Juba? Obviously, don't know Cousin Juba. I know who's Cousin Juba. But it was those guys that never had the opportunity to tour overseas. They never had the opportunity to put on a, a, a real, a real springboard blazer. I'm not talking about the white springbok blazer, but the so-called suckers springbok blazer. That has never existed. So, you need to understand that there was thousands of sportsmen that never had the opportunity to tour South Africa. So the young generation don't think there, was, there wasn't uh, this guy Majola. Some of you might know him. An outstanding, outstanding cricketer all around her. He never had the opportunity to play on the big stage. Yeah. So my question is, what was sacrificed so you young people could have the freedom which they have today? Sure, thank you, you so much. Mm. It was not allowed. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you so much.
We'll take the second question. Good evening, Melanie. Uh, many interesting things were said here. I listened carefully, but I want to ask this question. What is the topic of this uh, uh, meeting here tonight? How did the liberation struggle become an obstacle to liberation? I've heard very little about that. The history is interesting. It's, it's very interesting. But I feel we, have, we are not addressing the issue here. Sarkos has been mentioned. What was the principle of Sarkos? John Hart spoke in 1981, the opposition to the racist Bob tour. Sarkos said, uh, I'm making a speech. You answer my question, madam. What was the topic and have we really addressed uh, this, this topic? Sure. Um, thank you so much. I'm not going to uh, say or force any of the speakers to answer that particular question, um, but I think it can hang as well. We can, we can allow it to be there. All right. I, I would love to respond. <coughs> okay. Thank you very, very much, Madam uh, MC. Uh, yes, I've listened to both Ashwell and to Mr. Marsdorf. And I'm not going to blow my own trumpet now, but Ashwin Desai, he's still as passionate and committed to, since the first time I met him 34 years ago. And he must keep it up and he'll definitely get a lot of support with that mindset and attitude. But to get back to the rugby issue, <clears throat> yes, I have a problem with it. Why? You know, I haven't read the book, but I'm definitely going to buy the book and read it. Maybe I'm, uh, and I hope that uh, I'm correct in what I'm going to say here now. But based on what I heard, the book sort of concentrate on Makanda, Grahamstown. But we, here in the Port Elizabeth area, we have got rugby players. There's a few of them sitting here. One of them is right here, Edgar Marie, one of the best scrum halves that you could have had. Right? Uh, Ashwin mentioned about Desmond Kramer and Desmond Boyson. They would have walked into any international team. Desmond um, uh, Boyson was called the Janine Engelbrecht of the so-called non-white rugby. Yes, we had, P we had players like Parit Abrams. We had players like Armin Ortel, right? Dougie Allison them. We had, uh, the, now, there are some players that are still alive today that can be the archives that you require. There is China Bell, for an example. Ray Mort was regarded as one of the spring, uh, great Springbok wings, correct? China Bell made Ray Mort look that small. China Bell is still alive. So let us, you know the archives, there are still a number of archives that are alive today from whom you can get the necessary information to again, maybe do a follow-up book with all of those great players. There's a, a, one of the speakers here mentioned, Kasim Jabbar, Jabbar. We used to travel five times a year up to Cape Town or the Western Cape to watch Western Province, Somerset Board, uh, City and Suburban, uh, Tigerberg, and uh, Wurland. Right? And they were fantastic players uh, in those teams. But I mean, if we concentrate on the Eastern Cape, we have living archives that you can get information from. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. Unfortunately, due to time, um, I, I do know that um, you know this book launch and also the rest of the discussion for the day has really sparked a lot of thought from everyone here and online. So I'm just going to wrap up the conversation by asking then Ashwell first um, to give your closing remarks and then maybe to touch on a few uh, questions that have been asked. And then I'll go over to you then Ashwin, straight after Ashwell. Look, um, the one thing that I can say about this book is that we have used our own money to do this book. That is why I was saying it's a catalyst and people should try and, and, and do something in the area. It's no use, we talk about things and we talk about things, but nothing is happening. Many of our people are dying 
and we don't have that stories. So it is now the time to start recording that stories. <laughs> Prof Desai, if you could give your closing remarks and maybe just uh, sum up some of your final thoughts then on the conversation that's ensued today. Uh, you know, just, just firstly to say that, you know, I've had snippets of the audience and, you know, I just wish I was there uh, at South End Museum and just talking and interacting and having a party afterwards. Sometimes we're too hard on ourselves. I'm 63 years old. You know, let us celebrate some things, whether you sack us, or your NSC, or your ANC, or PAC, or Unity Movement. We defeated apartheid. Be happy. You know, congratulate yourselves. Stop being, you know, so dastardly and hard on yourselves. It's, it's important. We have our scars and our little wounds and our big wounds. But we defeated apartheid. And people who are sitting in that hall, your CVs together made that. You had dreams. And so, I want to celebrate that. But I also want to say it is 2022. People make history, but not just as it please, under circumstances not chosen by themselves. But they make history. We in 2022, we know, we know Dennis Brutus was a poet. Treachery, treachery. But we can't keep talking about treachery, treachery. You know, we know about Judas. We know the long history of betrayals. But we get over it. And we begin to build something new. It's the second large stage of struggle. And what the political bosses and the sports bosses in any sport are trying to do is trying to say to you, we taking control of things. You can't change things in your street, in your neighborhood, in your area, in your school, in your university, you can change things. And I find more and more of my friends, they, they keep talking about the big issues. Hey, what happened at Pala Pala game reserve? What happened with Zuma and so on? But they're not activists in their areas. And we saw during COVID, during the looting in KwaZulu-Natal, during the floods, how important were the little people, those people who went to a temple, a mosque, a church, those neighborhood watches, what they did, how they brought communities together, how they rebuilding houses as we speak in KwaZulu-Natal. Not those big people who can say a man la in Khan la. We know that we're toy toys, but there's something we rebuilding a struggle. We rebuilding a sense of ourselves as a people. We are we are we are living in an abnormal society, but we want to change those societies. And nobody, because of our race, because of our gender, because of our transitioning, should put us on the back seat and make us feel small again. There are people in this country who are trying to re-raise tribalism, re-raise racism, and we mustn't cower in front of them. My God! You know, as Prague's governor said, when she was member of parliament ANC, people who went to Robben Island like Atrada and so on, they faced the might of the party regime, but they couldn't face their own party when they made the arms deal. So they're cowards and they're heroes. They're little people and they're big people. And this is what this book is about. It's about little people who made history, little people who keep inspiring and say to us, the reason that we have an agenda of militant non-racialism that wants to change the very landscape of South Africa is because of those people in those little towns across the Eastern Cape and elsewhere in South Africa. That is what we get up in the morning and get committed to. Now, people might fight different battles. People want to also stare down people. They also want to be more revolutionary. But sometimes when you're more revolutionary, you're more reactionary. Because you, you're so out of the game, you're not even on the substitutes bench. I want to be in the game. I want to be playing the game, not be played by the game. We still want to struggle. We still want to make changes, but we know that since 1994, there have been incredible setbacks. And I want to end by this. Everywhere we learn from each other. It's hard lessons that we learn. The one of the biggest lessons I learned from Dennis Brutus when he was in Durban is that I so wanted to impress my hero. I had read letters to Martha. 
I had followed his life from the time he was shot in his stomach. He was a strong man, but Cannon Mazdop is right. He taught me two things, how to be gentle is to be a revolutionary. How to love is to be a revolutionary. And I'll leave you with this thought. He came to Durban and we had a march in a particular area and the drug lords and the drugs were infested and we were angry and we had tried everything. And in this particular march, we went to the drug lord's house and we did nasty things. And I thought, Dennis Brutus, the man who took a bullet in the stomach, who was tortured because he was fair and closer to whites on Robben Island, would be impressed with Ashwin Desai. And he called me inside, he said, Ashwin, in this area, people settle their scores by violence. Men and women live in an atmosphere of constant threat. Struggle is not about achieving an immediate end. It's but how you struggle, what you leave behind, what principles you lay before people. By settling these scores in the violent manner in which this march has was a reactionary move. But he said it in the most beautiful, the most embracing of ways. It changed me. It made me think about when we do go on marches, when we do go to meetings, how we talk, how we love each other, how we accept each other's views and challenge each other is sometimes more important than the winning of that particular battle. And, and we still battle. And so when we just recently in Chatsworth, in the middle of the floods, the city was taking bulldozers and breaking people's extensions of the houses because they haven't had housing in Chatsworth for 60 years. And like in Palestine, John, women stood in front of those bulldozers. We pushed them back in the most, in the most courageous, but the most nonviolent of ways. And now we have a moratorium on demolitions. We might not have got our adrenaline going. We might not be like pushing the scrum of the All Blacks back, but it was in a way, in my sense standing there, a, a honor of people like Dennis Brutus. So thank you for this opportunity. And I hope one day and soon that we shall meet. Thank you so much to both uh, Ashwin and Ashwell for uh, their for writing the book firstly, but also, you know, just uh, honoring this invite as well and coming to share your thoughts. Um, thank you so much as well, Mr. Cannon, for uh, your contribution to how you received the book as well. Um, we do have signed copies of the book. Um, they'll be available at the back. Um, they're signed by both authors and there'll be 290 rand for anyone who wants to get a copy. But speaking of signed copies, we've got two signed copies that we'd like to give away. Um, and we'll give them away to the youngest person in the room and the oldest person in the room. So the youth in between, unfortunately, doesn't <laughs> receive. Um, I suspect the youngest person in the room will be someone from Patterson High. So I'll give uh, your teacher to sort out who needs to receive that. And then the oldest person in the room. It's a difficult one because I don't want to ask the woman in the room how old they are. Okay, we have 80 years old. Anyone else? Hi. 83. Yay. That's the number at the moment. Anyone older than 83? A 90 maybe? <laughs> going, going. Sold to 83. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for joining us. I am not doing the official uh, vote of thanks. We do have the editor of the Herald, Rochelle, who's going to come and join us. 
to come and do the official um, thank you and the vote of thanks. Um, so just a, an announcement, I suppose, that we will have refreshments at the back. I mean, we did say that they are halal, but Rochelle will give us all the details then about the event. Over to you, Rochelle. Hi, everybody. That was a very spirited um, discussion. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Rochelle de Kock, I'm editor of the Herald. And um, as you know, it was mentioned earlier, we've had this long standing relationship with the Nelson Mandela University's CANRAD department. And um, for two years, we weren't able to host uh, in person events. So I'm so excited that this was our very first one. Um, can we call it post-COVID now? I, I suppose we can, our masks are off. And I, and I couldn't have, I suppose, picked a better venue for this event, knowing the, you know, the rich history um, that is on these walls and um, the rich history that we were, uh, you know, sort of touched on today. And there were quite a few things that really stood out for me. And, and, and I think this will hopefully answer the question that the gentleman had earlier on about you know, the theme that we had here today, and I think very much so we did touch on it. Um, some of the things that, you know, were discussed, uh, for instance, by uh, John Minto, um, him talking about how, you know, we need to basically sit and chart a way forward, um, and it, it requires each and every one of us to do so. Um, we all have the talents, he said, and to build a movement that transcends South Africa forward. I think that it then touches, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name, the, the lady that spoke, you know, so passionately and, and it really resonated with me, um, talking about how, you know, our integrity should not be sold. It should not be for sale. And, and that's something as, as, a, as a journalist, I like to call myself a young journalist, um, that, you know, resonates really with me. And, um, you know, in the face of adversity, we all need to, you know, maintain our integrity. Um, our country is going through a lot. Um, we are seeing a lot every day. And um, yes, maybe the liberation movement is not necessarily, um, you know, going to be taking us forward. But it requires of each of us to do something. We can't just sit and be bystanders um, while we watch things, uh, you know, just implode. And um, some of the spirited thoughts, uh, you know, challenged us to do something about the challenges in South Africa today. We have a history, as we've heard, of, of demonstrating. We have a history of speaking out. And the message that's coming through is, is really for us to continue to do so. Um, and I really just want to, to, to say that that's really something that stood uh, out for me. And um, I think, you know, it, it's, it's all good and well to have memories, and, and this is from uh, what Master was saying, but it's so important to document our own history. Um, and, you know, we might want to talk about decol having decolonized education, but, uh, you know, as, as John mentioned earlier on, how do we start to do so if we are not the ones that are, you know, putting pen to paper and documenting that history? I suppose I have the privilege uh, as working at a newspaper that we're documenting history every day, but it requires more, um, more of that. And, and we have our own living archives, as, as one of the speakers had mentioned. So those are just some of the thoughts that I thought um, I could touch on and, and, and that really uh, stood out for me. And uh, let me just get some of the thank yous out of the way. First and foremost, I was very excited to see Patterson High School pupils here. For those who don't know, they were um, our Herald uh, Suzu School Quiz winners this year. <laughs> I absolutely love what the school is doing. I love what the teachers are doing at the school. Um, keep it up, young people. You know, you really are just, you're, you're phenomenal. Um, I, I really, I love the school so much. Um, and they're getting more books now. I know that they received quite a lot of books earlier. <laughs> Uh, this year and um, I just like to thank I see there's quite a few sporting legends that are out here in the audience today um, thanks to everyone who's come out um, you know I know it's raining um, and you know we, some of us might be still afraid to to be in-person events but 
it's quite exciting to be here and being able to mingle with each other again. Um, thank you to Colin and I believe Bev played quite a big role in in putting you know everything together here from the from the South End Museum. Um, as I said earlier on, it couldn't have been a better venue um, for this type of uh, of discussion. I'd like to thank the Nelson Mandela University for your continued support. Professor Kiet, thank you so much. It's so good to, to have you um, here and actually you know, speaking at one of our events. Um, Ellen and your team, fantastic as always. Um, let's hope that we'll have another 10 years and more <laughs> of, a, of a relationship where we have these important discussions. It's so important for us to have this dialogue. Let's, let's continue to do so. Um, thank you to our speakers, um, all of you that have participated today. Nobu, you're fantastic as always. She's, she's done this before quite a few times, um, as you can see. And um, yeah, so thank you so much um, to everyone that's come out. And um, I hope I didn't speak too long, but you know, enjoy some of the refreshments with us. Um, come ask some questions, hopefully the the panelists will allow, you know, just a couple of pictures maybe. Um, maybe they can sign some books for you all. But thank you so much. Thank you.